We're in the book of Nehemiah. If you know anything about the book of Nehemiah, you may wonder how, what is the connection in the story of Nehemiah and the people of God returning from exile around 450 years before the birth of Christ and your own personal life. At the end of the day, we came here today for to hear something that's going to be meaningful for us. And we did not come here to get just a history lesson. And so it's an important question that we have to ask. And it brings up a question or a topic that we talk about in our Wednesday night Bible study uh, in our principles uh, of exposition or understanding what the Bible has to say. And we talk about this principle of travel instructions. You see, there's a danger when we open up God's Word. It doesn't matter if you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament because it's all a long time ago. So Old Testament or the New Testament that you think immediately what does this mean for me? And so if you can picture with me a triangle right now, and at the top of that triangle, God's Word. What we like to do, what we do when we are hurried or rushed in God's Word, is like we draw a direct line from God's Word to our situation. And when we do that, it's dangerous because God's Word, while it is relevant for us today, was not originally written for us today. And so we must do the hard work of understanding what it meant back then, to understand what God is trying to say to us today. If you, if you skip that step in your own personal Bible reading or teaching or preaching, you can really do a lot of damage to people. Because, for instance, if we were to read the book of Nehemiah and you did not understand what it meant for them back then and how that applies for us today, you may leave here today or in the next few weeks thinking that God has called you specifically to build a wall. Because that's what Nehemiah does. That's what the people of God do. They build a wall. And then you can think about all the funny stories or tragic stories in the Bible. If you read the Bible that way, you may think that God is giving us another Noah. You may think that God is giving us another Moses. You may think that God is calling you to take the journey that Abraham took to a place that he would find out one day. But that's not what God's Word is there for us to do. We have to do the hard work of understanding what God is trying to speak to us today and how he's trying to transform our hearts. You see, today he may be, for some of us, giving us encouragement in other words, he's saying keep going in the direction that you're going right now. The things that you're doing, the things that you're thinking, the way that you see your life, he's encouraging you to keep going in some of those ways. For other, others of us, he may be giving us a direction. We may be at a crossroads of our life and he's saying go this way, not that way. And God's word sometimes serves as a warning or a rebuke when it stops us dead in our tracks. But when we come to God's word, the intent is that God's word would transform us. So whether that's something that you do in the morning time before you start your day, if that's something that you do as, in a teaching ministry or as a Sunday school teacher or teaching, doesn't matter what age, or you have a preaching ministry and a teaching ministry where you're doing that for other people, we're all supposed to be transformed by God's word. It has a word to speak to us today. And so we're early in the story of Nehemiah, just in chapter two, and it's a story of God restoring the people of God to their city, but we mentioned a few weeks ago that we believe that God is building something among us today, namely his church, that he's working on the kingdom of God being spread all over the world. He's working and raising up disciples for himself, and he is building his church. The work continues even here today. But there's also a work, we might call it a project within the project, as God is building his kingdom, as God is building his church, he is also building his people. So there's a project going on in my heart and in your heart that is included in the project that he is doing in other people's lives and churches and communities and such. And so there's always these two projects going on, a work that God desires to do in our heart and a work that God is doing in and among us. Both of those works require faith. It does not require more faith to be a pastor than it requires of me to be a Christian. It doesn't require more work of you to be a godly mother or father, husband and wife, a godly student, a person who follows after God. It doesn't require more faith for that and less faith for doing the work of sharing the gospel or building a family or teaching a classroom or serving in the military. Both of those require faith. You have to believe that God exists we have to believe that God's words are true and that his ways are the best way. And when we believe that, we follow those things. 
regardless of what we are attempting to do for him. And so the invitation this morning is that we would join in the work that God is doing among us. You may not know of much of the work that God is doing this morning, or you may be well aware of all the ways that God is working in your life and among you. We asked a few weeks ago, where is God at work? That might be an important question for you to think about when we leave from here, when you have a little more time on your hands. Where is God working in your personal life? Where is God working on And maybe in your family, in your marriage. Where's God working in your life, even as a a young person, a middle school or a high school student or a college student? Or maybe you're at the other end of the spectrum and God has been working in your life for decades and you're wondering, where is God at work? Is God still at work in my life in my 70s, in my 80s, as he was in other times? And I believe he is, and the point is that we would join in with him. Because I do believe that God is working in your home. I do believe that God is working in your career. I do believe that God is working in your school. I do believe that God is working here in our church. You may be visiting from another church this morning. I believe that God is working in your church. And I certainly believe that God is working in our community, in our state, in our nation, and around the world. The point is, will we join with him as he does this. And so the main idea this morning is written in your worship guide. It's on the screen. It's simply this. The book of Nehemiah teaches us that we can have confidence that God is at work among us and gain the strength we need to join him. So you may be this morning completely unaware of how your current situation in life will be used by God for his purposes. You may think to yourself, how in the world would he use me Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, how would he use you to further his purposes in this world? Nehemiah may have felt the same way. It's interesting when we end chapter 1, it just simply tells us, now I was a cupbearer to the king. That was Nehemiah's station in life at this point. It's an important job. It's an important responsibility, but he was simply the cupbearer, not even simply, he was the cupbearer to the king. And so, Little did he know that God had positioned him in a place in his life that from there he was going to use him to do something incredible. Now we read that story and we know the story of Nehemiah. We're at least a little familiar with it. We may think, well, that makes sense. The question though is that do you understand that your current station of life can be used by God to springboard into the work that he wants to do? Don't take that to mean that he's going to move you somewhere else, okay? Okay. That he's going to take you from this job or this family or this location and move you all the way over here. It may be just a new work in your own family. It may be a new work in your own personal life. It may be along those lines. It could be that other, but it also could be what I just mentioned. And so, thankfully, Miss Roberta read this story. We're not going to get into the verse by verse explanation. But you remember the story. Nehemiah is upset and he's saddened. And because he's saddened in his face, the king notices this and he asks him what's wrong. Nehemiah says to him, why shouldn't I be sad? Because all of this negativity, all of these bad things, all this trouble has happened to my homeland and to my people and it breaks my heart. And he asked that question in such a way that the king Obviously says, well, what's the ask, Nehemiah? What's on your mind? What's in your heart? What can I help you with? And so Nehemiah pleads with him in that. Notice in the story that when Nehemiah is presented with the question, what is wrong? That before he makes that ask, he prays to God. But then he asks. I wonder in our own life when the opportunity presents itself, are we so quick to rush in to the work? Are we so quick to rush into asking Or do we do the necessary work of preparing our heart first? It can be one of those things where, God, I know you have called me to do this, but please give me favor. God, I know you've called me to be a godly father, but help me with my children. Lord, I know you've called me to be a godly godly teacher, but help me with my kids in this day and age of COVID. It's, It's okay to be clear about what God wants you to do, but for Christians, it's not okay to bypass the important step to pray for those things. And sometimes when we read stories like this, we miss the obvious that Nehemiah paused and he prayed. 
And then he asked God. And then some crazy things happened in which Nehemiah did that. It's found for us in verse 4 through 8. I want to read that 4 through 8, but I want, I want to highlight a few things. Verse 4 says, Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you may send me to Judah, to the city of my father's, father's graves that I may rebuild it and the king said to me and the queen sitting beside him how long will you be gone and when will you return so it pleased the king to send me and later on it says in the end of verse 8 it says and the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of God was upon me and so we see in that paragraph where there's a request he prays he asks and then the king grants. And then Nehemiah interprets for us what's actually going on in this. You may say that it was a great coincidence. That there was, man, he just happened to catch king on a good day that day. But that's not what he interprets it in verse 8. He says, the king granted me what I asked for the good hand of my God was upon me. And so he sees this work as God's hand working in his favor for good. It's not uncommon in the Old Testament for the writers to use the language of God's hands at work or his outstretched arm or his mighty arm. When we think about the Exodus, God redeems the people of God with an outstretched arm. In the Old Testament, that's a demonstration of his power and his glory. And so he believes that God is at work for him, not just to carry this about, but in general sense for good. It's important to see here at this point that someone might send you to do a job. But it is the good hand of God that gets you there. How many times do we attribute what's going on in our life and the opportunities that we have to just chance? Just being at the right place at the right time. Maybe some of you are like me, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Am I allowed to blame God for that? I mean, are we blaming him for the good stuff? Uh, we give him credit, but I think that part's my responsibility. All right, uh, but, but seriously, God is doing that. I want to ask you this morning, just, just think for me for a second. Where do you see the good hand of God upon your life? All right, don't just think about, don't limit yourself, but don't just think about the big, extraordinary wall-building world-changing moments of your life? Where is God at work in your life right now? If you, and I've been in this season before, if you're struggling to put your finger on it, that should give us a pause for concern. Because I can promise you, God is at work in your life. And we don't need to go long periods of time without realizing it, where he's doing that work. But maybe he's fostering some things in your business life. Maybe he's fostering some things in your relational life. Maybe he's fostering some things in your career that he's working on. But he is at work. Do you see him at work? It's interesting in our story that it, this is the chapter where the opposition to the work presents itself, okay? How many of you know that uh, whatever the phrase, whatever the saying is, when something good's happening, there's always something bad or someone bad trying to, trying to complicate it, trying to mess it up for you? It's the same situation here. Every time we read about the story of God's people and God moving in the world, there seems to be always a group of characters that are committed to giving opposition, to being strife, causing strife, causing issues. This story is, is not any different. We have characters introduced, Sanballat and Tobiah. And so you may know when I say Sanballat and Tobiah, you may be thinking about somebody's, somebody else's face when I mention those things because you have, those own, you have those own type of people in your life right now that when you're doing something for God and it's moving in the right direction, you always got opposition to it. I got a newsflash for you that won't be that much of breaking news. It's certainly not fake news. Anytime you try to do something good, anytime you try to do the work of God, you are always going to have opposition. It, it may be your own flesh, all right? 
hey, I've never done that. Don't want to do that. Not interested in doing that, okay? If God called me to give the rest of my life singing his praises, like literally singing, the, the other side of my brain would be like, boy, you can't sing. That'd be like my flesh. Or in other words, you're doing something else for God and then, and then there's people maybe in your own family, maybe people that you work with in your neighborhood, people in the community are like, hey, listen, um, that's fine that you did that over there, but you can't do that here. Or that's fine that you did this back there in your time, this time of your life, but that's not needed right now. Or there's this worldly opposition to the gospel and the work of the gospel. We're interested in you helping pay bills, but we're not interested in you telling that person the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're interested in you helping them in their temporary need, but we don't want you to talk to them about sin. We don't want you to talk to them about the Bible or the hope that you have in Christ. And so anytime the work of God has presented itself, there has always been opposition there to meet it. And we see that in this story. We see these characters as being people who were offended that someone would care about the state of the people of God. Self-centered, making money, sitting in a position of power, and when change comes, they notice it for what it is, something that is not going how they planned. And instead of joining in with it, being excited about it, that someone cares about the people of God, they present themselves as opposition. And we'll see in this story, as the work of God progressed, so did their opposition. That's always there. There's there's no way for you to do anything of note in your life or in your work or in the community or in this church without facing real opposition. And so we might ask ourselves at this point, as we see Nehemiah engaged with the opposition, what or who plays largest in your eyes? Who plays largest in your eyes when you face opposition? Is it the God who has called you? Is it the God who is at work up until this point? Is it him or is it someone else? Is it other voices or other people? Sometimes we call this fear of man or fear of God. It means that sometimes you and I fear man more than we fear God. There's a great book out there, When when People Are Big and God Is Small. And we face that all the time in our life. When God has called us to do something and we're continuing to work in that and we face some opposition, we look at that opposition as if it's something enormous, something that God cannot handle, something that we have to quit over. Instead of focusing on God, the one who has called us, the one who has sustained us, the one who has demonstrated time and time again. And so who plays largest in your eyes? And so in the story, they get to Jerusalem and he spends a little bit of time going around at nighttime with a few people just inspecting the walls. I mean, you can imagine this in your mind. He's gone there to build a wall, and the first few things he does is he walks around to check on how the wall is. What's the work going to be like? And it says in verse 12 that he told no one what God had put in his heart to do for Jerusalem. Now, we might think, conspiracy age that we live in, that this is kind of shady. Like, if God told you to do this, then the first thing you should have told was, you know, put it in a sticker, put it on a t-shirt, put it on social media, tell everybody about it. But that's not what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah first went to inspect the walls. He went to walk around and have a look. When it says that he did not tell everyone what God had put in his heart to do, this is the sort of work that carries with it a moral obligation, So these are not up for negotiations, really. This is the kind of work that God puts in your heart to do, that if you do not do it, you are being disobedient. He didn't just tell you to go down, you know, he didn't just tell you to cut the grass. He told you to do something that carries with it a moral fiber, consequences. I'll tell you that he keeping to himself, I can relate to this. When God put in my heart a long time ago, I'd say five, five, five six years ago, uh, revitalization and what that would look like. And I was reading about it and kind of thinking about it and having conversations with other people. And you begin to look for where is God calling us to do this? 
God began to bring Brookwood into the conversation, which was a conversation, in my conversation, long before it was a conversation with anyone else. And for whatever reason, I kept that to myself early on. And I remember that when I would go, back then I used to drink Dunkin' Donuts. I've since repented of that, and I realized that Starbucks coffee is better than Dunkin' Donuts coffee, even if it's more expensive. But I used to cut the block and come down here, and that's when the, the child care had the fence with the yellow on top of it. And I remember thinking, God, what are you, what are you up to there? Like, what is this going to be like? I've grown up in a traditional Baptist church. I mean, I know and as much as you can know before you get involved with something what this is going to be like. But God, what are you doing? And when I believed that God was calling me to that, then I began to share that with other people. But I had to kind of wrap my brain around it first. I had to think about it and process through it. And, and then me and Katie talked and me and a, some mentors talked and me and some friends of mine talked. And everywhere a step along the way, there was confirmation in that. I also had opposition, but that was okay because again, who plays largest in our eyes? And so when God calls us to something, it might be important to take a look around. Instead of telling everyone what you're going to do, just focus on the work. Walk around the wall and check it out. It's at this point in the story, at the close of the chapter, that we really find the climax of our story and what I want for us to see and to focus in on. In verse 17 it says, Then I said to them, so, you know, Nehemiah has been real quiet up until this point, and he turns to all of those people that are with him, and he says, I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. All right, so He's not telling them anything they haven't already seen when they rolled up to Jerusalem at this point. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. But then there's a call. Come let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And then I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And so notice when he tells them the work and the trouble, he begins to share with them what God has done for him and the ways that God had answered these prayers and provided for him already. So his faith begins to kind of spill over and be something that they can grab a hold of. And look what it says there, and they said, let us rise up and build. You can imagine how this conversation is going up until the point where he begins to explain how, king, how the king and queen blessed this work. That they're like, hey, listen, this is nice and it would be nice if the walls were rebuilt. But I got too much stuff to do. All right? I, there's no way. I don't even know how to build a wall. I don't even want to build a wall. But when the story of faith begins to overflow from Nehemiah to the people, they see that and they catch a glimpse of that and they're encouraged in that. And it says, let us rise up and build. We're gonna, you're not going to be just doing this yourself. We're going to do it together. And it says, they strengthen their hands for the good work. And so in chapter 2, this is the climax of the story. When they see the trouble, the negative mess. Now, mind you, this negative mess is a result of their forefathers and mothers being disobedient to God. So this, they didn't walk up to Jerusalem and have no part to play in this. They come from the mess makers. They heard about, though, God, good hand upon Nehemiah, and they committed themselves to the work and strengthened them, their hands for the good work. That word strength there means to be courageous and to overpower. This is what Moses had in mind when he spoke to Joshua, be strong in the Lord. Joshua was about to go into the promised land and take it by force. And Moses told him to be strong. You know the story of Samson, strong guy. He had all of his power taken from him. But at the end of that story, there's a moment when Samson prays to God and his strength is returned and he destroys the temple. It's the same word. Those builders strengthened their hands like Samson strengthened his. And like Joshua strengthened his. And so what is the trouble that you and I face here this morning? We asked this question last week. And I think it is the brokenness of our lives and of our world a direct result 
of the presence of sin in our own personal life and the presence of sin in our world. And the only thing that can fix that, the only thing that is strong enough to repair that, the only thing that is strong enough to overpower the power of sin is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when you're searching for the work that God might call you to do, I might look there in that trouble to begin with. But then it also brings with us this this idea of strength and where does strength come from? So let me talk for a moment to to the whole entire audience, but I'm I'm thinking specifically for teachers. I'm married to a teacher. I'm a fan of teachers, all right? I'm thinking about moms. Mom's got a tough job. You're keeping up with your kids, all right? I'm, I'm the only child of my mother, and so she had a tremendous job that she was responsible for, all right? I'm thinking about fathers too because Fathers get a bad gig sometimes. They're doing the best they can, working hard, providing for their family, and they cast a long shadow in the lives of their children. I'm thinking about many of you here work in the military. A lot of you in here are retired. All of us in here are in a church this morning. And it's important to understand where our strength comes from. Where did their strength come from? Their strength came from hearing how God had already been at work in providing for Nehemiah, so they rose to the challenge. Newsflash, the wall gets built. And we answer the question, where does our hope come from? In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, Paul, speaking of God, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for in my power, for my power is made perfect in weakness, for when I am weak, then I am strong. It is God's grace that is sufficient for Paul to carry out the work that God had given him despite the challenges and the thorns of his flesh. So when he asked for God to take away the thorn, God said, my grace is sufficient. So where does Paul get his strength from? It doesn't come from within. It comes from God providing it for him. In the ending of Ephesians chapter 6, it says it like this. Finally, this is right before we get the armor, the spiritual armor section. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And so if you're staring down an incredibly intimidating work, whether that is raising kids, teaching kids, working in a military, working in the world, pastoring a church, want to be a church planner, want to be a pastor down the line, whatever intimidating work that stands before you, how, do you, how are you going to prepare yourself for that? It could simply be staring down a cancer diagnosis, staring down the end of your life, Staring down the next 10 or 15 years alone. How, how do we get strong for stuff like that if not for the grace of God? It is God's grace that gives you and I the strength to carry out his work. This is a Christian principle. There are a lot of cheap imitations out there. This is an inherently biblical Christian principle that when we come to God in our weakness... God's power flows through us to accomplish the work he desires to do. You don't need to get strong on your own. You do not need to gather a couple of other wiser, stronger people around you to tackle the work. The first and the last place that you and I go for strength is in the Lord. And he will give us what we need. He always gives his people what they need. The people of God in this story do not all of a sudden turn into master builders. Extraordinarily strong and committed people. They are faithful people and then they get the job done. And so church this morning, what does the gospel of Jesus Christ obligate you to do with the rest of your life? You personally as an individual. What does the gospel obligate you to do? And we as a church, what does the gospel obligate us to do? And, and it's not simply partnering to, to revitalize other congregations and partnering with churches to plant congregations all over our city and, and our county. That is part of it. 
but it might be simply gospeling your children, gospeling your spouse, gospeling the people you work with, your neighbors. That might be a a, a real viable place to work. It may, it may include those other things, and it certainly, it ought to be broad, but, but don't pass over the places that God desires to work in and through you. But the gospel of Jesus Christ does obligate us to work. We don't just get to sit and enjoy the benefits. We are called and have responsibilities to join with him and work. And so, Ask yourself that question, what is God obligated, what is the gospel obligating me to do? But then ask yourself this question as well, because I I bet that the idea of making disciples is not new to you. It may just be, it's been a while. When is the last time you spent some time inspecting the walls of your life? When is the last time you spent some time inspecting the walls of kingdom life around you? You know that you're called to do this work. And for whatever reason, you haven't been active in it. Maybe spend some time looking at the playing field, examining relationships, examining neighborhoods, examining places that you might be used by God to do this work. It's tough when you preach and you don't nail down one important application thing. Like if I was preaching on giving, I'd be like, now bring your money down front. But uh, that's, that's not how this sermon goes. We have to do the hard work of self. We got to work on the self. We got to think about that. And it's not just about you. It's about where God wants to work in and through you. I, I told y'all last week, and I've said this, I'm going to say this multiple times. There is no second service. There is no campus. There is none of that. There is only sending our people to carry the gospel around the city and around the world. Okay? So when we when we hit that maximum, that's that's the plan. But long before we get that, we have individuals who buy into that sort of lifestyle and that change. Because I believe that this is the work, this is one of the most important works that God desires to do with you is for the rest of your life, is to work through you to reach people, to make disciples for his glory. And so let me just give a word of caution before we we end. I hear a lot from people from time to time that God told me to do this. All right, that's like the ultimate trump card. Hey, I was praying and the Lord told me to do this and hey, who's going to argue with that? All right. It's a, good, it's a good way of getting out of difficult conversations, all right? It's true for pastors. It's true for, for individuals. I've sat, had people sitting in my office, and they're like, hey, God told me I need to leave my wife. God told me I need to leave my husband, all right? I'm done. I ain't got to love him no more. That's what God told me. And I scratched my head, and I was like, now, where did he tell you that at? All right? And so we just come up with these ideas like God told me to do this. And so I'm laboring to get you to work for the Lord, wherever the Lord's calling you to do that. But I want to give you a word of caution because sometimes we, we, miss, we misinterpret where God is calling us to work. And so I think there's, there's really three things, we, three questions we can ask ourselves to, to see if it is really God calling us to work. Is the work being done for his glory? Is the work that God's calling you to do for his glory, or is it, is it always about you? Is it about your comfort level? Is it about, your, is it about something about you that really is driving this work, or is it for the glory of God? If, if you did this work faithfully for the rest of your life and no one ever noticed it, can you sleep well at night? Is the work being done according to his word and ways? I read a, a story, big, big church out west, pastor left his spouse and God told him to do it and he left them to be in the arms of one of his volunteers. And so that is not according to his word and that is not according to his ways. Are you doing this work according to the word of God? Staying within its parameters, following the example of Christ, consistent over 
time with how God has worked? Are you following the ways of Christ? Or are you treating people harshly? Are you domineering? Are you abusive in your language? Abusive in your, your, your feelings? Are you, are, are you trying to do God's work under your own power and beating everyone into submission? Or are you doing it his way? A life of sacrifice, a life of service, patience and joy, gentleness. And thirdly, is the work being done in the strength that God supplies? Some of you in here are incredibly strong individuals. Some of you in here are incredibly gifted. You're well networked. You have a lot of resources. You can do a lot of good in this world apart from the strength that God supplies. Now, some of y'all can't, all right? You're like me. You can't get off first base unless the Lord swings the bat, okay? The key is doing the work that God has called you to in the strength that he provides so that during the course of the work and in the celebration, it's all for his glory. If you lean on your own strength, you'll always be burned out. If you lean on your own strength, you'll always be impatient. You'll always be frustrated. You'll always, you'll always be empty. But if you lean on the strength of God, you will find power to do what it is that God's called you to do. Let's remember this morning that the book of Nehemiah teaches us that we can have confidence that God is at work among us and gain the strength we need to join him. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you this morning that we are not left to ourselves. God, that you are committed to this work more than we are. You're committed to the work of sanctifying us and making us more like Christ. You are committed to the work of getting the good news of Jesus Christ out into our families, out into our communities, out into our schools. You're committed more than we are, Lord, to getting the good news of Jesus Christ in our city and in our county and in our state all over our country and around the world. And you are sovereign and able to use things that we would be unable to use to work about your perfect will and to reveal your love that you have for all people. And God, you could do this without us. But I'm thankful that you've called us to join in with you. And so God, help us as we reflect here this morning and as we reflect this week to see where it is that you're calling us to put our hands to work. And God, we would find our strength for that work from your gracious hands. And that we would have the courage to join you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.